Hi everyone, this is Alpha Bunga Bunga, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. And this is the third and final part of Uber Mention of Capital, a series on the intellectual history and contemporary reality of capitalist heroes, captains of industry, disruptive entrepreneurs, and the consequences of living in a world built around such figures. In part one, we talked to Alex Gurevich, who proposed a political theory of the entrepreneur, the special kinds of assholes we get in our economy. He suggested that the cult of such figures might in fact be a dangerous development. In part two, we look back over the 20th century at the strange confluence of economically liberal ideas with some very dark anti-democratic political forces with the help of Ishai Landa. But what if we society democratically constituted were to take on the role of those who assume leadership over massive economic units. In part three, we're talking democratic planning, and we're joined by Lee Phillips and Mikhail Rozvarsky to do just this. Hi everyone, this is Alpha Bunga Bunga, and today we are George Hoare in London and myself, Alex Hochuli, in Sao Paulo. This is the concluding part of the Uber Mention of Capital series. So this is where we solve all the world's problems. We have all this to look forward to. Uh, a very big welcome to not one guest, but two. Firstly, to Michał Rozworski, an economist at, who works for a union in Vancouver. And a welcome back to Lee Phillips, who's a science journalist and author of Austerity Ecology. That book you can hear more about in episode 23, I think it was, way back when. Um, hi, guys. Hello. Hello. So these guys have a new book out next month called The People's Republic of Walmart. Uh, That title sounds very enticing. And I think for someone who's just read the book, I can confirm that it really is. Uh, It's actually one of those sorts of books that I feel like I want to send it to loads of people and insist that they read it right now so that I personally don't have to repeat the arguments myself. (laughs) Um, It's a book which actually kind of modestly pretends it's an introduction, but that's a good thing because it prompts you to look up all these names that are cited of scholars, uh, kind of heterodox economists and other figures of planning, uh, just to cite a a few which I noted down, which I I personally found quite interesting. Eleanor Orstrom, Herbert Simon, Ronald Coase, Crazy Eddie Lampert. Uh, (laughs) That that last one's sort of a joke. We're actually going to find out why that is. So, right, let's get started. I think one of my favorite lines of the book is, We might describe Jeff Bezos as the bald, moustacheless Stalin of online retail. And I think that line uh, (laughs) perfectly encapsulates what this whole series that the Uber mention of capital is about. So up till now, we've discussed capitalism's tendency to build up these captains of industry as, as heroic and necessary innovators. And also how that defense ends up shading into authoritarian and repressive and even anti mass notions that one might associate with fascism. Something we cited in the last episode was that Hitler's economic thought was basically that if the factory is a place of domination and discipline, and that that basically works, then why shouldn't society as a whole look like that too? So you guys start off your book with an emphasis on the capitalist firm, uh, that whole domain, who rules there and what goes on in there. And what's striking is how much human activity actually takes place within these units, which are sites of domination, but also of planning. So could you guys tell us about this? Like, how, how, how is it that these mass units are actually sites of planning and not of markets? Sure. Do you want to take that with the uh, sure. I, I, okay. islands of tyranny stuff? Yeah. Sorry. So this is the beauty of writing, uh, writing with someone that you can always sort of, you know, <laughs> hive off, put the responsibility somewhere else. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's, kind of the kind of the the basic idea behind uh behind the book is just you know originally we're sort of thinking let's bring back the idea of planning and we had this uh you know back in the 30s and the 40s and even the 50s economists would actually uh debate socialist calculation whether it was feasible whether planning of an entire economy was feasible but we quickly realized that that's you know this kind of bring back the debate is kind of the wrong framing and that the right framing is that there is a whole ton of planning that already happens in our economy and a large part of the book is just sort of highlighting that fact and of course as you say you know it's sort of 
bad planning in the sense that it's authoritarian based on, you know, labor exploitation um, and all the rest. But a large chunk of our lives, you know, the, the, the parts of our lives where we're at work, where so many of us are at work, um, there's no market, right? The, the foreman um, or the supervisor doesn't call out, you know, prices until someone goes and takes a box from one shelf to the other. Uh, he or she just tells you to do it and you do it, right? And that goes all the way up um, the entire firm. Um, and as, as, as you already sort of foreshadowed, you know, er, places where uh, someone like crazy Eddie uh, Lampard, who tried to, you know, create these sorts of markets within, within firms, quickly realized that um, it, it failed, right? That you created um, these kinds of really bad competitive structures within um, within firms, which which would end up um, corroding corroding sort of the main uh, the main business of the of the company. Um, so I mean, I think that's and uh, I can't remember if you cited it or not, but we have this quote from from Herbert Simon, another person uh, you mentioned, who's a big sort of 20th century economist, not maybe as well known, um, popularly not not as well known, but uh, but really important to the to the economic profession had. Um, some really interesting things to say about um, human rationality and, and challenge some of the sort of really naive orthodoxy about human rationality. Um, and one is sort of uh, one that sort of, you know, fake economic Nobel Prize um, <laughs> for it. Um, <laughs> the uh, book actually makes ab about what is it about 10 mentions of the fake Nobel economic prize and takes great pain to mention that it is a fake Nobel <laughs> economic prize. <laughs> it's, it's it's just important to get that's you know that's absolutely really our that's our second argument in the book just to really make sure people understand <laughs> now i'm a little um, bit worried about the copy editing process because i think that was flagged that we had uh, repeated ourselves there so uh -oh. <laughs> that's you know two authors who feel very strongly about this um both making that point um but regardless of 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 you know the the stature of the prize that um uh, that he won he, he does have this um this great quote actually from late in his career um, in the 90s where he says, you know, imagine uh, a Martian uh, visiting, visiting Earth and he's looking from, from afar and imagine he's kind of, you know, looking at, um, at the economy and economic relations and he sees this, these big green blobs, which, which are the firms, and then these thin red lines of sort of market transactions that connect them. Um, and how would this... Martian, how would this visitor from from uh, from beyond Earth, who kind of you know naively doesn't um, understand that much about um, social and economic uh, relations, describe what's going on? Um, and it would be you know it would be clear that there were these huge uh, domiciles of sort of of planning that were loosely connected um, by by market exchange. Uh, just to take it back to the title, um, the this sort of realization that. Um, uh, you know, Walmart today, uh, even though itself is um, internally uh, uh, centrally planned, undemocratically centrally planned, but democrat, but uh, centrally planned nonetheless. You know, the volume of the, um, exchanges there, the the economy of Walmart today is larger than uh, the Soviet Union at its sort of you know economic height before before the sort of collapse sort of set in in the 1980s. Um, and so you begin to think, oh well, that's 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 fascinating in terms of this old. Um, yeah, the, the socialist calculation debate, the, 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 the argument that we just have sort of swallowed or um, just take as, as, a, as, as, a, as a norm, even, even on the socialist left sometimes, just that the planning doesn't work at scale. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking here more some of the people who've embraced market socialism. Um, um, that, you know, we're just assuming that, well, of course, that's right. The, uh, the, the right won the argument in the, the socialist calculation b debate. Planning at scale doesn't work. But then, wait, then how does, how does Walmart work? Because if it's, right. it, if and... it's larger than um, uh, the Soviet Union at its height, how does it get away with um, this, this incredible logistical marvel um, and, and the Soviet Union didn't? So, what, what, uh, so that's sort of where we, we went with that. 
Yeah, and I mean, you kind of propose in the book that you look inside the box, as it were, that so much e- economics fails to do. It, it puts emphasis on on the market, that is the transactions between economic units. And you're kind of going, well, look, let's look at what goes on inside these economic units, which actually take up a huge amount of space if you were to kind of map it out. And and so, the, I mean, the basic idea is that the, the entrepreneur, something that Alex Gurevich called in, in the first episode of this series, Capital Personified, is that this is a genius that, that exists and operates in the market. But actually what's crucial is what he actually does within his own domain, within his own dominion. And the picture that emerges for, from your book is, is that capitalism is not a, a bunch of little gorillas all fighting and startups and, and you know creative destruction, but actually these mass armies, these mass established institutions, which are fully integrated and organized. Yeah, I think one mm-hmm. one of the one of the things that was quite uh, not so much startling, but um, sort of confirming um, our our argument a little bit was that um, once we opened the box and looked at what what ha- actually happens within within Walmart in particular, and for this we were looking at um, so, you know business scholars, so people who are defenders of um, of, of capitalism, uh, defenders of of the Walmart revolution, and you you. Um, you look inside that box and you find that uh, it is this uh, th- this sort of marvel of cooperation of, of of almost in many respects flat cooperation between between Walmart proper and its suppliers a sort of uh, giving up of um, uh, trust on the part of, um, uh, uh, of of the Walmart leadership to to the suppliers themselves to decide uh, what is going to be stocked and in turn. Um, Walmart uh, delivering uh, information about what has been sold and what is still on the shelves, for, you know, from a microsecond to microsecond uh, basis to to those suppliers. Um, uh, that 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 scale of 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 trust um, and cooperation, uh, you know, a number of uh, scholars sort of jokingly um, uh, sort of talk about this sort of like socialism, and some uh, you know some even more critical people. Uh, think you know, uh, suggesting that is 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 this still capitalism? And I think, even though these are business scholars that are um, sort of half jokingly asking those questions, we sort of answer that in the affirmative that you know, actually, there's something something interesting, go- uh, much more interesting going on here. Um, and I mean, we should be very clear that um, uh, it wasn't us first that that asked the question. So uh, Frederick Jameson, the uh, the sort of literary critic and political scientist. Uh, a Marxist, um, you know, in a, um, a a couple of essays a few years ago, he he asked that question uh, whether Walmart is this this uh, you know utopia. If I can just quote f- um, from from him, it's it's pretty short and it, it yeah. gets gets to the the idea. Um, the literary utopists have scarcely kept pace with the businessmen in the process of imagination and construction, ignoring a global infrastructural deployment in which. From this quite different perspective, the Walmart celebrated by Milton Friedman becomes the very anticipatory prototype of a new form of socialism for which the reproach of centralization now proves historically misplaced and irrelevant. It is in any case certainly a revolutionary reorganization of capitalist production, and some acknowledgement such as Waltonism or Walmartification would be a more appropriate name for this new stage. Now, Sir Jameson, there, I don't think is being some sort of um, uh, uh, snarky contrarian. Um, I think he's genuinely saying um, the the real utopia uh, is is basically right in front of us. Uh, that already there is um, uh, the the sort of conceptions of, um, of of planning upon which this this more egalitarian society uh, had to be based is 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 sitting right in front of us and we need to explore that not to say that this is um and i guess we're going to be talking about this shortly in terms of um hierarchy and domination in the workplace and 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 so on um but that not that walmart right now is already socialism that's quite not the uh, the point that we're trying to make but that uh, the question around planning um has already actually been answered um in the affirmative in terms of is it feasible i think i think one of the most in- interesting sort of parts of the, the framing of the book is is just just to pull it back a little bit is this idea that actually so much of economic activity does go on at the level of the firm and as you said jameson illust- uh, points to walmart as one of these uh, potential example of how this this could be a precursor of socialism so um i guess one question that we we wanted to dig into a little bit more is the history of 
of Walmart as as an as an organization as a as a firm because as you detail in the book um it's grown quite a bit since its first store um which was called Walmart Walmart Discount City in Rogers Arkansas with a population of 5700 um to the private company that it is today so it's got the third um most uh workers of all enterprises in in the, in the world I think in as, as you detail after yeah. the US Department of Defense and the People's Liberation Army and the most <laughs> of any private um organization equivalent to the economy of Sweden and Switzerland or as you said the the uh, USSR in the 70s so how did it a, a bit of this kind of um history I guess how did it how did it grow to be so large and what's what are some of the the ways this tension where it's planning but it's not socialism uh came out um, it comes down to the um, uh, sort of uh, planning systems uh, that emerged in the 1970s and 1980s that were uh, made feasible by computerization, basically sort of uh, continuous replenishment um, uh, processes that um, uh, uh, that managed to more successfully reduce the the sort of bullwhip effect, which is where. You know, slight changes in um, uh, demand uh, or supply uh, begin to be magnified throughout the the supply chain, and that this this continuous replenishment, um, basically, again coming back to what I was talking about before, in terms of uh, this trust on the part of the um, um, uh, Walmart proper and its suppliers, uh, the sharing of information uh, to to be able to very quickly respond to that. Um, um, but well, it, sorry, let, yeah. let me just jump in here because I mean you call that trust and cooperation, but it's mm-hmm. a little bit like if a gorilla comes and sits next to you, yeah, you're you're probably going to cooperate, aren't you? <laughs> well, so this is, could... yeah, so this is interesting because um, a lot of uh, discussion has been about how nobody uh, can uh, so Walmart um, it, it, it basically swallows these 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 operations these organizations up and that they have uh, no choice but to uh, to uh, to do what Walmart tells them and this is basically true um, in terms of getting into the tent but once they're in the tent um, that's um, that that sort of cooperation and, and trust it, basically I, I would say that there's no longer any real distinction between Walmart and its suppliers you can't really talk about them as uh, as separate entities. Yeah. Or, you know, or it's a, it's a kind of breakdown of that kind of naive market relationship. And I think, and this underscores that it's not, it's both within firms, but increasingly also um, between firms too, where we see these, you know, relationships of um, rational planned rather than sort of anarchic, spontaneous yeah. uh, relationships emerging. And I was going to add, you know, the, there's Jameson and, and his, I mean, I, I, I but uh, there's also, you know, Bloomberg columnist Matt Levine, which we also mentioned in the book, um, had this piece, I think it was two or three years ago, uh, titled Our Index Funds Communist. Uh, because, because increasingly uh, more and more, you know, as, as more and more investment happens through ETFs or electronically traded funds and through these um, index funds, uh, there's less, you know, literally kind of less pressure for competition between capitalist firms. And there's, you know, whole sectors that within capitalism, you know, you just get a sort of trend towards oligopoly and um, which has lots of negative side effects, but also but towards a kind of sectoral planning, even if, again, even if it isn't explicit and even if it still happens on the basis uh, normally of kind of market relationships, um, you get something that goes, you know, that moves closer towards the thing that Jameson was describing, or, or towards something that's rational rather than um, rather than purely anarchic. Um, and you know, and again, this is it's 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 interesting. You know, recommend all leftists to read the Financial Times and Bloomberg and things like that because you get these kinds of questions asked in some ways um, in more innovative ways than than you will uh, you know in the places where we're you know the Guardian or wherever we're used to reading them. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a, a, a good bit of advice. Read the FT, not the Guardian, to anybody who's listening yeah. and considering still reading the Guardian. <laughs> well, I think we're actually thinking of doing an episode on uh, the, the left wing case for the FT. So uh-huh. nice. that to look forward to. Um, so just to, com- uh, I think one of the interesting parts of the the early um, couple of chapters of the book is when you compare 
what Walmart did with what one of their competitors did. So you've got Sears and this this crazy Randian uh, guy, uh, Eddie Eddie Lampert. So what what was um, what was their approach to the uh, decision making within the firm? Put it that way. So so Eddie Lampert, when he uh, you know basically takes over Sears, he's you know uh, this hyper Randian who who is so horrified that. Uh, looking in, in again inside the box of Sears and sees how everything is uh, cooperatively planned. Basically, he feels that he's it's communism that Sears is communism, and so uh, because he's such a true believer in the market, uh, he decides to introduce the market. Uh, or market-based uh, decision making into the firm, setting up departments in competition with other departments, and. Of course, it's a complete disaster of, of duplication and uh, lack of sharing of information, um, <clears throat> resulting in just utter disaster. Um, and as and we see that today with uh, you know the the company um, um, floundering. So it's kind of At- Atlas mugged off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can edit that out. Um, no, I just I just think it 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 was it was funny reading how some of the people who used to be executives at Sears were like yeah basically it just led to to really um to business practices which are supposed to characterize the the free market and and successful businesses just basically reducing the overall profit obviously of Sears as a as an organization and leading to it um uh, it's battery brand Die Hard, which I didn't know it was called that. As a as English person, it's a great name for for their batteries. <laughs> how they can't sell millions with that that brand name, I don't know. Um, but yeah, how just profits collapsed as they just didn't have any um, any ways of working together yeah. to to improve the overall and profit so, line. So the the irony here is that you know you contrast uh, that with 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 Walmart, where you know the, this comp in, internally once once the uh, suppliers are served. Sort of, uh, assimilated, let's say, uh, by the uh, Walmart Borg, um, you know, um, the the company sets in place these long term, high volume strategic par- partnerships. The suppliers, there's this uh, uh, you know, incredible data transparency and uh, cross supply chain planning, um, but not just in terms of the, um, uh, the you know the production and supply, but also even t- just in terms of marketing, um, where everybody is basically. Um, uh, working together, um, whereas Eddie Lampert um, uh, does does the does the opposite of this. Um, yeah. Well, it's amazing what happens when an actual capitalist takes seriously the words of an apostle of, uh, of apostles of capitalism, such as Hayek or whoever, and mm-hmm. tries to actually implement them, and it all comes out to be a disaster because, uh, well, it creates all these inefficiencies. It creates actually a huge amount of bureaucracy if you're having to have billing departments, billing other departments constantly, you know, that just creates a whole new layer of bureaucracy, which supposedly capitalism is anti-bureaucratic and it, and it sheds all these inef- these inefficient sectors of paper pushers, you know, that it's har- hard-nosed and ruthless. And in fact, it's kind of the opposite. Well, this comes back to the uh, to the argument that effectively that we're making or remaking, because if you can, you know, go back to Marx and some uh, other uh, early Orthodox um, uh, uh, Marxists, um, you, you know, we <laughs> um, th- there were always two arguments that were made in terms of criticism of, of capitalism. The first, of course, is all of the stuff that we know about the injustice and increasing inequality and so on and so forth. But the second is just the 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 inefficiency, the duplication, um, the irrationality. Um, uh, the, the waste, waste the of waste. human potential and talent, Ex- right? exactly, and that um, uh, we see that in, in in Sears, but but Sears effectively, in many respects, is just what we're seeing uh, globally uh, with uh, with capital with the market writ large. Um, okay. And so, and we, the- to, to to sorry, just to to re uh, you know reaffirm this secondary argument, not merely about injustice of capitalism, but its utter inefficiency. Yeah. And the same thing happens, we might get to this in, a, in another, guys, um, but just a quick note that something similar happens to the NHS in the UK, which we also, um, we dedicate a chapter to, to that. And in its sort of latest incarnation, um, especially after, after not even so much Thatcher as, as much as after New Labour, um, well, after after both of them, but this, something similar happens where you get these sort of internal markets um, introduced. Um, literally, the program is called, you know, in, in the early 90s, the internal market within the NHS. Um, and you get the same thing, this sort of explosion of bureaucracy within this very, you know, sort of 
<laughs> within the state-run bureaucracy that was criticized by Thatcher and her ilk for being this, you know, lumbering, um, lumbering, uninnovative, whatever you have it beast. Um, and I, I could look it up, but we have some figures here, you know, where the, the sort of explosion of, of middle managers um, and spending on, on management within the NHS um, under a sort of program of neoliberal restructuring that introduces all these, um, you know, crazy layers of providers um, and purchasers of health services billing each other um, mm. and having these, you know, market relationships um, uh, take over from what were, you know, much more simple kind of plan relationships. Okay, we need, the, you know, this many knee replacements or whatever, we're just going to pay for them. Right. I think even if you're someone who believes in markets, thinks that they're okay, that they're good, that they're necessary in certain places, the idea that you need to create these pseudo markets, like within an organization like the NHS, I think that chapter proves that quite dramatically that the introduction of the creation of pseudo markets through the agency of the state uh, leads to disastrous consequences. Uh, and I think that's actually kind of a feature of the book as a whole that you kind of go chipping away and you go, okay, well, let's we accept planning here. So what if what if we did it here? And what if we did it this way? And I think w one of the ways in which you you adopt this approach is with regard to consumer goods as well, because people tend to accept like, okay, fine, you want to plan steel industry, you want to plan electricity distribution, water, etc. Cool, we're all good with that. But you know, I don't want the state taking care of like the widgets that I buy or, you know, the booze that I buy or whatever, right? The kind of the, the, the kind of all the the colorful circus stuff of capitalism, right? All the all the bright lights and, and, and shiny colors uh, that you want the market to provide. And you make an argument that actually a form of democratic planning could could satisfy those 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 needs, those desires. And you look at Amazon as, as just such an example, which uses big, da big data in contemporary planning. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about Amazon and how this fits in. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, in some ways, um, the Amazon example is similar to and a kind of natural outgrowth of the Walmart stuff. It's also a large, you know, it's largely a distribution network. Um, for for consumer goods it has a lot of uh you know it does a lot of other things and um is actually you know responsible for a huge part of the um of servers and, and sort of the internet services now but um all of that is an outgrowth of um of its basic function as a kind of um consumer goods not even a consumer goods producer but just a um a distributor which which walmart is um is as well but one that um takes that big big datafication which was as Lee said was already happening at Walmart where Walmart um, you know became such a behemoth because of its early adoption of you know barcodes and um, and all the rest of this and all the rest of this stuff and then Amazon takes it um, you know to, to the next level as it were with with uh, with the internet um, and big data and and the lack of sort of you know physical uh, physical outlets um, but also in, in a very similar way, also integrated um, with its suppliers, um, where production decisions at, you know, like Procter & Gamble about toothpaste um, will partly depend on um, data information and sort of, you know, orders from Amazon that aren't, um, that aren't just based on willy-nilly sort of on on demand or on market prices or what have you but but have this kind of integration of planning of production um with distribution uh, and i guess I the that's yeah yeah i mean the, the argument traditionally would be that or the argument against planning traditionally would be that you just wouldn't have access to enough information and yeah. even if you did have the data it would be just impossible to compute all these things and yet amazon shows that you can plan for example the possibility of, of a weather event meaning that a flight is delayed meaning that the product doesn't arrive and can't be shipped and yet it can still tell you order now and it'll arrive to you by saturday 3 p.m and that's kind of a marvel i mean it's a marvelous thing this is it. This is exactly it. Is that uh, I mean, one of the reasons that we picked Walmart and Amazon was precisely because uh, these are very uh, consumer-facing um, uh, multinationals, and so 
as you say, it would be very easy to historically make the argument as to why, you know, steel production or uh, or coal production or even, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, NASA, you know, space exploration. While the, these big beasts with very few or relatively fewer uh, decisions to have to be made in, within the production um, uh, uh, process, um, uh, those are, you know, okay, fairly straightforward. Okay, we, we, we get how that might possibly work with planning. But uh, there's just so many more um, uh, uh, decisions. There's you know a couple of orders of magnitude more in terms of decisions that need to be made with you know um, uh, Barbies and 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 uh, uh, you know how many different kinds of dresses that uh, uh, she can wear and, and and so on and so forth. So uh, so to be to be to be honest, we have to say that maybe potentially uh, that sort of dis, uh, decision making was not possible until relatively recently, until you know the the computerization of the 70s, 70s and eighties, um, and even today with uh, you know you know uh, big data, in that we do now have the capacity to be tracking all of these these decisions. Um, uh, or the, the the different decision points, decision uh, along the production process that that we we weren't able to before. But then the second argument I think um, we would make is uh, sort of related to this, not just in terms of the uh, production process, but against the second argument uh, that uh, you might have instinctively against planning for these sort of consumer items, which is. Yeah, sure. Okay, maybe you can um, plan the production, but how can you plan uh, what people will will want? And are we really just going to have three types of genes and that's it, as as opposed to the millions of types of genes? Well, again, thanks to the um, to the arrival of big data, um, uh, we can see within these 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 corporations um, the uh, up to the second um, um, knowledge of what people are wanting and then making decisions about uh, production right at the back end, not merely in terms of um, manufacturing, but even back to uh, the raw materials extraction, um, um, reducing, as, as I said before, the bullwhip effect, um, even for these sorts of products. And to, to the extent that uh, these algorithms are able to uh, not merely uh, correspond to assessing what people want on a second to second basis, but also be even predicting what they will want before they even know that they want them. Mm, yeah. And indeed, not I mean, just we, we... not just uh, the whole variety of genes with a J, but maybe genes with a with a G. <laughs> 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 no, that, yeah. I didn't want to get too sci-fi here. That wasn't that wasn't my point. <laughs> Sorry, Mikhail, I interrupted you. No, no. I, all I want to I mean, I think I think that's um, that's right. Maybe not the genes with a G, but everything else. Who knows? Um, but no, I, I mean, I think, you know, Hayek um, had a line some, somewhere about, you know, but prices are essentially, you know, communication prices and market relations are, are essentially, you know, like communication, instant communication over distance, um, which, yeah, I mean, goes back to that point that in the 30s, you know, when we had the tel or the telegraph was the best other form of communication, um, instant communication at a distance, that, that might be true. But these days, there's so much more, you know, we already have, we have telecommunications that far exceed um, in richness sort of, of information content, um, what prices could or would or, sh or, or have, you know, have, um, have accomplished. Um, and we do have that example of this sort of, you know, Amazon had this crazy patent idea that garnered a lot of news a couple years ago, you know, over over a day where it was this patent for so-called anticipatory shipping, where, you know, you sort of thought you wanted a pair of jeans and then lo and behold, the next day it would arrive on your doorstep without you, um, with you just sort of thinking that you wanted it rather than, than having ordered it. Um, and, and, you know, that's kind of silly, at least even at... at um, at this point, um, but it does it does show um, it does show what you can sort of accomplish with um, with information and with recommendation systems and with what you know with the kinds of things that aren't even necessarily you know linked to price, um, where sites like Amazon or you know or Walmart or what have you are already tracking sort of you know how you're browsing, what you're browsing, what you're looking at, how long you spend and all of this. And this allows, um, and this kind of data gathering can inform both production and distribution. Of course, right now that production distribution is geared towards 
um, profit um, and has little sort of, you know, um, little collective kind of decision making uh, over it. Um, but it's there for the taking, you know, which has always been a sort of mm. socialist argument. Well, and I guess, I mean, even if most leftists would probably not, would want to exclude some of the wilder excesses of consumer capitalism from any future socialism, mm -hmm. for, for a lot of people, they, they maybe are people who are resistant to the idea of socialism are resistant precisely on the grounds that it will mean a gray, bureaucratic, oppressive world without any stuff, basically. And that I think your argument proposes that no you they would still have a lot of stuff and it would actually be a lot more efficiently and rationally allocated and precisely because computing provides this so i mean if if the marxist argument for socialism always depended depended in part on the development of productive forces that that needed to achieve a certain sufficient uh, degree to be able to implement socialism perhaps one thing that wasn't thought of in, in the mid 19th century is that computing would have to develop to a certain degree to be able to to achieve this and and i think the, the mediest the, the biggest mediest part of the book actually deals with this question head on. And I think it's probably the bit which uh, I guess for, for politically interested and politically informed readers, people who read mostly about politics, this is the bit they'll know the least about. And in some ways is the most important part of the book in, in a technical sense. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about, you know, how computing has developed and what, what, what is the relevance of computing to socialism, let's say. I suppose uh, one of the things that could be uh, said about this is that um, the, if we, you know, without going to some sort of, um, uh, you know, done some, some, some hyper, you know, in, uh, mathematical road here, uh, to trying to keep it uh, as understandable as possible. But basically the, the, um, one of the, um, the challenges has been that, um, there's simply, there's a, uh, an infinity, uh, of different, um, um, variables within a production um, chain, a supply chain, and that it is not merely um, impossible to calculate that um, or plan that, but it's actually even sort of impossible uh, mathematically uh, to, 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 to come to any sort of, um, uh, to, to track all of those, uh, those variables. Now, we have to concede that that is actually true, you know, that I think that 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 has actually been mathematically proven. But here's the weird thing is that we don't, it turns out that we don't actually need to know that full infinity of variables that, um, so, uh, that so this actually, would be prices, basically, I mean, if we were right, to translate yeah. it into yeah. kind of an economic discussion. The, the reality uh, is that it's, it's prices or physical quantities, though, right? Right. Yeah. Potentially also. Uh, that all that information uh, we don't need. We don't actually need the the full inf infinitude, let's say, of of all of those variables. That um, we can get close enough um, with current processing power uh, to deliver on the things that we've just been talking about. So, uh, put it another way, what um, um, what's the 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 argument? You know, the historic argument. Well, you know, socialism is all very well good, uh, well and good in theory, but it doesn't work in practice. Actually, we should turn this around. Um, in theory, it shouldn't work mathematically, but in practice, it does. And yet, people will point to the Soviet Union. So, I think we maybe have to deal with that uh, at sooner or later in this episode. So, maybe now is a good p place to do it, as you've already proposed it, I guess, is, uh, you know, people say, well, the Soviet Union failed. And your argument is that it didn't, it's not that planning leads to authoritarianism, but on the contrary, that authoritarianism leads to bad planning. So could you explain that out for us? Exactly. So again, this is the historic argument from uh, Vamises and, 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 and Hayek and Friedman and so on and so forth on that, that side of uh, things that, um, uh, that planning in net because of these gaps, uh, in information, it will inevitably lead to authoritarianism. And if you if you actually look at the the history of the Soviet Union and, and Goss plan, it's it's really quite the reverse. That the authoritarianism, um, where people who are responsible for uh, for tracking information in, in factories or on uh, uh, within fields, whatever it happens to be, uh, were so frightened uh, on pain of death. Of reporting that they did not actually, um, uh, their, their sector had not actually produced what uh, had been targeted, that they would lie. Um, and that this undermined the information in the system. And uh, that that was fundamentally the problem. 
Uh, now we could say, well, isn't there a similar sort of process within uh, the authoritarianism of, of Walmart that, again, it's not genuinely democratic planning. It's not um, it, it is top down and there is a there is a certain fear of uh losing your job and I, and we would say again i think that yeah that probably does uh, that authoritarianism does undermine the information the quality of the information in the system but not to the same extent you know losing your job is not um the the same uh, level of threat as um uh, of being being shot uh, so the the scale of the reduction of the quality of information within the system there is is less than uh the the destruction of information within the the the, the soviet system but then interestingly what this points to is imagine if there were weren't that authoritarianism at all. So not merely taking over Walmart, a uh, Walmart system or uh, Amazon or whoever we're talking about, and just like uh, re-implementing it as, as well, well, now we've elected the leaders, but actually the, 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 uh, we, we are talking about a, a transformation of, of the system itself using the logistics and the, 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 and, uh, the, the data wrangling and so on and so forth, but truly um, implementing it in a, in a democratic fashion. Um, that, that in fact, what we would find, or at least this is our hypothesis, what we'd find is there should be um, an increase, uh, a commensurable increase, a commensurate increase in the quality of information in the system. So it should be even uh, an even more efficient system. Hi, sorry, interrupting here again to do that sales pitch. We haven't asked for money during our first year and a half, but now we have to because we want to expand. If you enjoy what we're doing and want to help us out, consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash bungocast. It's a pay what you want deal, $1, $5 or more, up to you. And remember to rate and review the show on iTunes, Facebook, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'll shut up now. And I think one of the most striking things about the book is how it, it just completely convinced me at least to the extent to which planning already happens within contemporary capitalist economies i mean, in the conclusion you write planning exists all around us and it clearly works otherwise capitalists would not make such comprehensive use of it um but are, are there any examples that we haven't talked about that you think listeners would be i guess surprised to hear about any any kind of examples of, of planning beyond walmart and, and amazon that that really um any any listeners out there who who are who are thinking of of how this 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 already exists um, w- would want to hear about? I mean, I think I think you know that kind of level of planning happens within almost any firm, right? And Walmart and Amazon are, um, I think, good examples, as you said, because one because it's sort of consumer goods, two because it's distribution, um, but in a way that also integrates production. Um, which has been, you know, which again, for, for, for in, in these debates for a long time has been, um, has been a kind of cudgel and people saying that, you know, you can't, um, fine if like, you know, again, you plan this, you know, the steel company plans how it produces steel, but how do you integrate that with, the um, with using steel, not just as an output, but also as an input for other production processes, um, which I think that was one of the reasons for choosing Amazon Walmart, because although it's, you know, it's still it's still not completely that, but but it is it is these supply chains that um, that cover larger and larger sort of sections of the entire production distribution kind of process. Um, and I mean that so that kind of thing hap- you know GM plans how it produces cars, U.S. Steel you know plans that, Huawei does that, um, most most firms um, most firms plan. I think the other uh, the other thing that I already kind of alluded to that was interesting for me was um, was the example of of the financial markets um, and the extent to which sort of planning for investment um, happens. Uh, and again, that's another area where we've historically been told, okay, you, you know, again, you can plan. Uh, you know, you need to produce twenty cars. Here's twenty tons of steel. Right, you need to plan to get from one end of that to to the other. Um, but what about you know? In that, how do we decide that we need cars and not uh, and not you know pencil boxes or whatever steel pencil boxes or or, or what have you? Um, again, it's it's sort of very. This is even more sort of prefigurative than than like a Walmart or an Amazon. But um, I mean, I think there's a lot of planning that happens. Within the fi- within the financial within the financial system, and again, it's um, it's done 
for profit, it's done through these, you know, again, it's not sort of like a cabal of bankers or, or anything like that. It's done through these sort of loose affiliate, you know, loose class, um, class based affiliations um, that are, you know, contradictory and, and nowhere near um, what, you know, what someone would call would call central planning. But there is um, there is a whole apparatus um, within the financial system of most advanced capitalist economies. Um, that isn't willy nilly, isn't as anarchic um, as we like to think. That does have um, a major sort of policy driver in the central bank. Um, that is, uh, especially now after the global financial crisis, um, increasingly um, now after the financial crisis and to to a degree um, which we don't go into in the book as much, but in the post war era, um, much more involved in the you know rationing and allocation um, of credit. Um, and then that is the driver of um, of production uh, of production and of sort of large scale um, economic rationing within uh, within an economy. Maybe talk about uh, index funds a little bit there, Michal. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I sort of talked about talked a bit about that, and and now increasingly um, the point with the with the index funds um, is similar, but it's more it's more what I mentioned earlier is the fact that you know that you get um you know if you have if you invest in an index that includes um all the airlines you don't really care whether it's american airlines that makes a profit at the cost of delta um and united uh you know you basically only care that they all you know that your index fund uh makes a profit um and you're more than yeah, you want the whole sector to, to do have, well, right? You don't. It's not about one one company competing against well, another. You want the whole. Yeah, exactly. So it it basically takes that element of competition partly partly out of it at the level of the of the investment decision um, at the level of the financial sector, and you're much more happy to have the kind of cooperation, cartelization, whatever you want to um, whatever you want to call it, um, happening at again at the top top sort of levels of the economy, not just um, within firms, uh, but between them as well. Um, so not only is, you know, both the sort of investment decision making um, more, more, more planful and more, you know, again, more rational in its own kind of way than, than we like to think. Um, but now increasingly there's these kinds of incentives for, uh, for that kind of cooperation um, between firms that, you know, that in, in the kind of toy model um, of a market economy um, that you find in a textbook, you know, shouldn't be happening is wildly inefficient and would quickly break down into chaos. You know. Yeah, and I mean, so one of the things that you do in this book in the People's Republic of Walmart is not just make arguments as, as you've been making, which might be able to convince uh, right wingers or you know libertarians or pro market types, uh, arguing that actually you know you guys are already doing a bunch of planning, so why don't you just accept planning on a larger scale? Uh, you also make some hard arguments against the left and, and specifically in the way that you term it is that you can't just nationalize Amazon. So you need something more than that. It's not just about lopping off the top of these planning structures that already exist and adopting and that the state incorporates these uh, structures and technologies, but that you need uh, a, a real reform to these structures or that you need a revolution uh, that they needs to have that specifically you make an argument for democratic planning rather than just incorporating already existing structures. So maybe you can talk us through that. Why, why is that important? Why can't you just nationalize Amazon? Yeah. Um, I can say a couple, a couple things. I mean, I think this is the, I think this is the hard question and the one um, where we just sort of gesture at things um, without going into too much detail. One, because I think it's hard, you know, it, to, to some degree, you want some of these blueprints um, from the for the future. To some degree, it's hard to um, to really make them in a you know in, in a in a very um, comprehensive way. But I mean, I think it partly goes to Lee's argument uh, that he just that he just made um, about the USSR and and about how you know just how degrading of of the planning process um, any kind of authoritarianism is, and and how you know that kind of exponentially gets worse as you scale up. Um, the authoritarianism. I mean, the other thing is just uh, is our conviction that 
as as you know as 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 democrats and as and as and as socialists that we want actual you know actual control over the economy not just the fact that we get to you know elect jeff bezos or or whoever but that we want people to be able to participate in um in economic decision making and and that I have this quote somewhere from um from duncan foley um a sort of lefty lefty economist you know where he says that what was what was missing from from the socialist calculation debate um which in many ways the debate in the 30s you know in, in some ways both the both the protagonists on both sides were kind of taking for granted neoclassical economics and kind of like the structure of the economy as it was and he and Foley says the real import of the historical social choice between socialism and capitalism is precisely what is left out of the socialist calculation debate the social relations through which people organize themselves to produce which is you know it's a little abstract but i think that's i mean i think that gets at just the fact that we can't be we're not just talking about technology or technique um yeah or how or what you produce you know, kind of, yeah exactly this kind of blind let's just like take over the machine taking over the machine in 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 some real viable way means you know reorganizing it and changing the machine in ways that we probably don't quite yet understand how that would um how that would function but it has to include um changing the social relations of production because because the way that capitalism plans is inherently bound up with you know with with that fact with the fact that you can you know you don't do what the boss says you lose your job right um with with the fact of of labor expo- exploitation and all of that and i think non-capitalist planning would look very different um than just you know a walmart with with elected managers or or what have you right and it's a sort of bottom up planning i mean and and this is something which you mentioned in yeah. the in your section about the soviet union that there were elements of this under uh, under Khrushchev, even beginning that it's not someone telling you what to produce, but that the producers are sending signals to the control center, basically. Um, and I'm going to hand over to George because I think his question relates a little bit to this. Yeah. So um, I guess one point that you made earlier was that, that one of the classic socialist arguments for planning is this kind of idea that individual rationalities can lead to collective irrationality. Um, and I guess why to kind of put it into political context a little bit and and the book which i think is partly so important because there aren't as many people talking about about planning in in this way as as perhaps there you would expect on on the left why do you think it is that arguments around economic planning have fallen away within socialist discourse especially given the i guess the technological advances which have made planning at the level of the whole economy um as as you detail much more of a possibility i think part of the uh i mean the um, the neoliberal revolution was so, you know, um, world historically successful in terms of its breaking the class. And I think we have to recognize the, the, uh, the utter success that the other side had in the 70s and 80s. Um, and then, you know, ratcheting that, that up after the, the, the end of the Cold War in um, um, ex- excluding all possibility of, 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 of socialism that, 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 that was pushed beyond the horizons of our imagination. Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, the philosopher, the late philosopher Mark Fisher talks about this in terms of his, his phrase, um, capitalist realism. And I think that's that that <clears throat> that basically is the explanation for this, that we uh, one. I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to write the book was we wanted uh, economics uh, writ large to, to 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 be much more prominent within leftist discourse. We have a very culturally focused left at the moment for good or for ill. Um, and it's it's about time to to be a little bit more materialist i think if that's now that might sound like a bit of a, a sharp jab but um elect a female um, jeff bezos uh, yes, yes. <laughs> um but <clears throat> I, I just coming back a little bit to the to the previous question i think we can actually say that it's not merely our conviction that uh, democratic planning would be better uh, that we we've seen all this hierarchical planning, so we're showing that planning works, but still it's hierarchical. But we're imagining that democratic planning could work. Um, we do have like one really great um, sort of hint about this from history, from relatively recent history, and that's you know the uh, the, right. the the cyber sin, the so- so-called socialist internet uh, under Salvador Allende in Chile, and. Unfortunately, it didn't last long enough for to, for us to see whether it would have uh, truly delivered on this promise. But 
you know, right at the the, the crunch point, um, just before the uh, the coup, uh, Pinochet's coup in uh, in Chile, <clears throat> the um, this um, uh, this 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 cybernetic uh, planning system that had been developed in a sort of prototype form. It didn't cover the entirety of the economy, but you know, fairly large swathes of the economy, and it had sort of been developed. Um, um, in a relatively top-down fashion, in the sense that uh, Allende uh, and his, his his ministers were the ones who sort of wanted this developed, and it didn't come from a grassroots uh, sort of uh, uh, bottom-up fashion. Nevertheless, when the crunch came and uh, sectors of the economy were beginning to break down as the uh, sort of small business uh, truckers were trying to to, to shut down the <clears throat> have a basically a, a strike, it wasn't. I mean, it's not really a strike, a strike of bosses, really, if you will, um, uh, that uh, these sort of local councils uh, or Cordones Industriales um, it sort of emerged um, to coordinate production um, uh, and sort of get around the blockades of the, the trucks and um, bottlenecks of production. And instead of the... <clears throat> Uh, the the cybersyn system telling them what to do. It wasn't the algorithm telling them what to do. It was more the other way around that they found they dis- so basically discovered this system and made use of it for themselves. So we can we can really uh, at least this this gives a hint of the future world that that could that, that could that could occur in that. <clears throat> it isn't merely our conviction, but we can sort of begin to see this hint this of of. Uh, of how it's not the algorithm that will do the planning for us, but we will use the algorithm to do the planning in a fully democratic, you know, a horizontal um, uh, locality to locality, workplace to workplace uh, fashion. So, it's, if anything, what I found interesting about going through the so all the research in uh, around Cybersyn, and I lean, we lean very, very, very much on the wonderful um, uh, work of Eden Medina, the the technology historian, and her book. Um, uh, cybernetic revolutionaries, you know, the, her history of, of, of Cybersyn is how it, you know, I, some, I'm not an anarchist, um, uh, but uh, it, it really does hint towards a, a sort of a much flatter hierarchy that potentially is possible, which is very, very seductive and, and tantalizing there because you begin, to, I mean, one of the things that we did with this book was we, we said to ourselves, we want to write a book that <clears throat> um, a, uh, a conservative or a liberal um, would read this and say, you know, you know, they make really good points. Or if they're a socialist or social democrat or Marxist, uh, sorry, market socialist, they would say, you know, there's some really good arguments there. But also, I think to some extent, uh, some of these arguments are around flat hierarchies <clears throat> begin to jump over some of the dis- uh, the debates between socialists and anarchists, and 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 we can begin to see this more this sort of flatter, um, uh, flatter higher democratic. Uh, uh, decision making uh, potentially emerge. Um, whether that's, I mean, how feasible that is, and to what uh, scale that is, we we aren't saying. Um, uh, which is actually, I think, a bit more of an interesting thing because instead of saying uh, it must be the state that does the planning or there must be no state that uh, uh, there, uh, it begins to ask the question of, well, how do we ratchet up towards a, um, a, a goal of a stateless society? And let's really think concretely about how that would work and what are the stages along the path uh, towards that rather than um, being stuck in the mud and saying, no, there is no other possible way other than there being a, a hierarchical state or no, there is no possible way for, the, for justice to happen without uh, there being a lack of a state. And now it's a sort of how do we transition so how yeah. how how and, might and you... what are the and sorry just to say and, and you know yeah. I think that's exactly it and what are the sort of institutions at every at every level up to where in the you know in, in the penultimate chapter we go through um, climate change and sort of you know the planning that would be necessary to actually deal with this at a global level so you global you planning yeah th- things below and above the state but in a way that isn't sort of as ossified and I think that was part I I, I mean I, I really agree. As, as, as you know, as I probably would um, with uh, with with Lee, but I think that was also <laughs> just in terms of sort of the personal experience of, of of writing the book that seeing all these largely seeing all these examples of hierarchical planning of your bu- of bureaucratized you know hierarchical planning um, whether in the private sector um, or the public sector whether it's sort of the NHS or the Soviet Union um, or what have you rather than rather than producing you know rather than 
produce, you know, a kind of Stockholm syndrome where it's like, yes, now all the, so the socialists, you know, we just need to do the hierarchical planning better. It gives you a kind of, I think, to some degree, a kind of healthy revulsion towards the, towards the, at least for me, towards the hierarchy um, alongside um, that real, um, you know, that real positive and hopeful look at the actual planning. Um, at some of the techniques and at the possibility that humans could actually be decision makers um, over and, and rationally encounter, you know, the social relations of production, but in a way that um, that really avoids this whole mess that that cuts through um, so many of the experiments in, in planning, whether they're at Walmart um, or or in the USSR. And that essentially sort of, you know, privatized the kind of group knowledge, group creativity taking it back to say, you know, something like your interview with Alex Gurevich and all of that, that really both privatized kind of for me, um, the group knowledge that that is, that should be the foundation of democratic planning um, and that really devalue um, human creativity. So do you think that there's a, a, a potential um, difficulty here that you're, you're kind of left with, with um I guess a third way almost between on the one hand these kind of Ooh, star <laughs> third way. <laughs> but wait, it's third another kind of third bad. way. <laughs> no, so third way means bad, synthesis means good. So we're so it's a critical question. So we're talking about third way. A third way between a st between kind of Stalinoid uh technocrats for planning and then these kind of uh, anarchoid um anti planning, anti economy types. So I guess the the question is how do you kind of how do you avoid the 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 no planning on the one hand and then the i think it's, it's you were kind of talking that the privatization of planning or the people who have the the planning skills which i think in today's economy would be would be coders or or, or people who actually know how to um to 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 do algorithms i'm obviously not one of those people if i'm using the phrase do algorithms um, <laughs> i guess but yeah i mean so i, I there's a there's a, there's a serious question here perhaps which is that how how do we how do we <clears throat> get around this possibility of of producing a, a class of of planners or, or some sort of um specialized planning knowledge which which creates its own um inequalities or its own potential for for bureaucratic power obviously it just means coding schools for, <laughs> for every, you know, char charter co coding schools um coding re-education camps <laughs> well yeah. you know it's, it's one of the f funny things is that uh, i would say that i do think that um, well, obviously not everybody should be a coder um, or study computer science. I do think that there's there's a very strong argument to be made for a left that uh, re-embraces mathematics and economics and computer science, uh, logistics, uh, operations research, engineering, um, that uh, we have a, a the, the sort of the academic left at the moment is very, very much, and I'm, I, I, I'm one of these myself, uh, who is, you know, split between the humanities and the, and the natural sciences, but uh, that is very, very much humanities oriented. And there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, we do need a bit of the other side as well. So there is that. But then I would also say that I think, um, going back to what we were just talking about with Cybersyn and the uh, Cordonus Industrialis, and uh, which are in many respects that those sort of um, uh, councils that emerged and made use of uh, Cybersyn rather than Cybersyn making use of them um, are very similar mm. to uh, the sort of autonomous, um, uh, flat, uh, popular um, forms of democracy that emerge regularly at times of not just revolutionary upheaval, but also, you know, any times of crisis or economic disaster or a natural disaster. Call it, call it a Soviet. Call it a Soviet. <laughs> or uh, you know, in France, the the Comité d'entreprise, or uh, the the Shura in in Iran during the uh, the early stages of the Iranian Revolution before it was uh, sort of captured by the mullahs. It, the, 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 uh, the, this is something that does seem historically to reemerge over and over again. And so, I guess our our, our hypothesis here is the old one that. Um, that the the basis of um, the of egalitarian democratic planning lies within, yeah, the Soviet really, the council. I think that uh, I think to, just to go back to your earlier point, it's it is really important for for socialism to. I don't know if it's rediscover if that's being a bit arrogant, but to re-emphasize the relationship between socialism and, and technology <laughs> and progress and science and basically that that forward motion and the forward movement and potential, which I think has been 
been lost a little bit, um, in, at least in certain expressions. Oh, absolutely. Because that's, of course, the... Absolutely. I, that's, especially that's... when faced with a you know, literal civilizational challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think George's uh, point that George, the point that George made about being stuck between a sort of you know, kind of Stalinoid economistic thinking, which is a bit technocratic, which is, you know, the idea basically you lop off the top of capitalist enterprises and you incorporate them into the state. And the other side, which is much more democratically focused and, and all about, you know, horizontalism and so on, but which has no idea of um, of how to produce, of how to organize production. And in fact, is kind of you know, deliberately sometimes ignorant of, of these questions um, and actually to be able to, to unify those those two aspects, which has always been crucial to socialism. It's about production and it's about democracy, basically. Uh, and, and sometimes we've, we seem like we're, all, we're stuck between these two stools. Absolutely. You got, I mean, I, I mean, I've written quite a bit about this in my last book, but uh, in terms of a critique of sort of environmental localism and the conception that everything that uh, needs to be produced uh, can be produced locally uh, in order to cut down on your sort of uh, carbon miles, right? I mean, one, it, it, that, that sort of breaks down, actually, if you just investigate that even the lightest bit in terms of uh, the, uh, it's actually so much more complicated than that than simply because something's farther away, therefore it is more carbon intensive. That's not necessarily the case. Um, but just even more interestingly in terms of the question around technology is, okay, well, can you, uh, uh, not merely locally in, say, southern Vancouver Island, um, where I live, um, so there'll be no chocolate, there'll be no lemons, there'll be no almonds, you know, n n no avocados. But also, more importantly, uh, <laughs> um, how... It sounded okay until he said no avocados. <laughs> how would you... How would you have a local computer? And you go to any of these local farmers markets, and they're using, you know, their their mobile phones and computers to process all of the uh, uh, their transactions. Um, how would that work exactly? You know, the uh, your uh, the the phone in your pocket um, uh, is, you know, there's about you know two or three different dozen. Um, uh, you know, sites of, of production that go into that. How are you, you none of that can happen, so not, not, sorry, all of that can't happen locally. So it has to be um, internationally uh, produced and thus internationally coordinated. So then the question is, well, how is that coordination going to happen in a way that is uh, non-market based I, without all of the, the contradictions there and duplication and injustice and inequality? And how are you going to do, but how are you going to do that in a, in a cooperative um, uh, fashion? And the argument sometimes will, they, they will respond, the localists will respond, well, we don't need those phones. We don't need the computers. And then really the logic of that uh, reduces back to a sort of uh, primitivism, even if they don't realize that they're, they're primitivists, where they're basically giving up on modernity. And they will say, you know, we don't need all of these so-called consumer items. Well, I mean, one, that's, that's a very gray uh, kind of socialism to begin with. And we go back to, you know, sort of the very critiques of East Germany or whatever. Um, but also the you know the number of deaths that would happen as a result of the 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 the, the illness and so because we're f effectively we would be giving up on all of the uh, you know fantastic um, uh, you know highly advanced medicine in in our hospitals uh, the the all of the the, the tremendous advances of, of modern medicine would 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 be washed away uh, with uh, with that abandonment of of modernity and tech and technology as well so. Um, we have to try to figure out some way of um, um, uh, yoking together um, a highly technologically advanced um, modern society with uh, with with democracy and uh, and, and and equality. Uh, we uh, we can't. Uh, uh, drop away the second part of that. We can't um, get rid of the, the, the modernity, the technology. Uh, that would be an utter humanitarian disaster. Billions of people would die. Right. And I think your book is brilliant in doing, in presenting a very self-confident vision in which we can have both things. And not only that we can have both, that we can have democracy, equality, but that we can have production and advanced technology. And not just that, but that these two things are essential uh, and that you can't have one without the other. In fact, what we have now is the, the this dichotomy of the anarchy of the market and privatized planning. And in fact, your argument is is very convincing in, in showing that you can that you can actually have democratic planning, and that you can have that you can and that we must and that we need to have the best of both worlds. That uh, that innovation and disruption and rationality shouldn't be the preserve of uh, the captains of industry. 
of capital personified in the form of the entrepreneurs, but that precisely this should be socialism. It should be innovative and disruptive. Absolutely. And going back to mm-hmm. what, what Michal was talking about in terms of uh, the, the civilizations or challenge, civilizational level challenge of, 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 of climate change and other sort of the, 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 the wider uh, uh, bio crisis, um, the, you know, the scale of th- we are now talking about um, having to coordinate um, the carbon intensity of the global economy. There's no way that just Canada can decarbonize. Um, and leave uh, India and China and Indonesia to continue to produce uh, production in a very carbon-intensive fashion. Um, it has to be globally coordinated, but we don't have any mechanism of, of global democracy. Uh, we don't have... Um, uh, and, and also, fundamentally, the, the, the this is a question of technology switching. We need to move from, um, from dirty production to clean production, which requires a, uh, an intervention in the market, i.e. planning, uh, uh, from either from a very minimal level in terms of regulation through to sort of global planning, basically what we're talking about here. Um, and so we, we sort of have no choice but to, uh, to be talking about global scale planning. <clears throat> in order to 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 tackle these questions uh retreat to the local will not you know it it holds no water there um uh, now the next stage is like well my god are we really talking about like global government yeah we kind of are so we we do not i i would say that the the uh, it's up to us uh now to begin to be thinking about and putting at the heart of our our analysis what would that look like because we do already have structures of transnational if not necessarily global um, governance uh, structures such as the European Union or the WTO or the UN Security Council but all of these again, again are even these are not democratic uh, structures uh, these are um, completely um, uh, insulated from democratic accountability and what we are seeing, you know, from the Gilets Jaunes to the, the, the growth of, of, of hard right parties um, and also uh, the you know, new far left or, uh, um, uh, f- uh, forms in, 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 in some parts of Europe um, uh, is a resistance to that technocratic, uh, undemocratically accountable um, transnational um, governance structure. So um, w- Whatever we have, basically we have no choice but to build to build some sort of global um, democratic um, de- democratic planning structure. But it absolutely cannot. We we've seen sort of already hints at uh, efforts at uh, hierarchical transnational planning, and it's falling apart at the seams because of that lack of democratic accountability. People feel that they have no control over uh, over those uh, those systems. Right, global. Democratic planning. There is no alternative. <laughs> That's basically the message. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, we're going to leave it here. Thank you very much, Lee and Michal. The book is The People's Republic of Walmart. I urge you all to read it. It's out. Uh, it's a Jacobin series out under Verso, and it is out next month. Is that correct? Uh, the a publication date was just pushed back a little bit to uh, March 5th, I think it is. It was supposed Perfect. to be February 19th, yeah. but it's now March 5th. Okay, perfect. Uh, available from from small retailers as well as uh, some big ones, which are laying Walmart, the seeds for Amazon. socialism. <laughs> I, I can't. I cannot wait until uh, Walmart stocks the People's Republic of Walmart, which will happen. Superb. All right, guys. Thank you very much. We hope you've enjoyed this series. If you'd like to help us do more, go to Patreon.com/slash/BungaCast. Thanks very much to all those who've already chipped in. And to everyone who keeps sending us feedback and ideas, we like it, keep doing it. Finally, if you like our visual identity and our theme music, you should check out their creators. Dewey at Ramune.io and Johnny Mundy are responsible for them. Huge thanks to both. Check out the links in the show notes. Alpha Bunga Bunga programming continues at the end of January. Catch you later. Bye-bye.